from downtown Decatur. It's the Faber Files. Hello, I'm your host, Bill Faber. Because democracy demands debate, we present this program on Public Access TV, a program of interests and issues about the Decatur community. Nowhere else on TV or radio are these issues and interests discussed in conversation at great length like here on the Faber Files. Tonight's guest is attorney Susan O'Neill. Susan O'Neill specializes and concentrates in Social Security disability claims. This is a very important area for many of our citizens, and we're really glad to have Susan with us this evening. Oh, glad to be here, Bill. Thanks for coming, Susan. Boy, I tell you, when, when, when folks need, uh, need some help, Social Security disability can really come in handy, but sometimes it's hard to get. It's very hard to get, especially in Illinois. It, it, our rates are, are of denial are higher than other states in the country, and it, I, th I would call it almost stingy. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, the way they um, deny claims, and, and sometimes at the initial level, um, where the claims are decided by a state agency in Springfield rather than actually a component of the Social Security Administration, I, I wonder if they even read the files. That's how bad it is. There's two different types of programs I understand that you work with, Susan. Social Security Disability and Supplemental Social Security Income, SSI. Yes. What's the right. difference? Well, Social Security Disability is a program where you have paid into the system. Every week or two weeks when you got your paycheck, people have noticed that there was a FICA taken out. Part of that was to go towards funding their Social Security. So this is, they are applying to access money that they paid in during their working career. SSI, on the other hand, is for people that didn't necessarily pay in enough quarters. It could be a housewife that stayed home all of her life and now finds herself disabled. We, as a, civil, as a civilized nation, don't want our disabled people lying on the gutter, begging. So they set up this program so even if you didn't work the quarters, but you are now so disabled that you couldn't go out and work if you tried, mm -hmm. you can still get something. The SSI amount is only $674 at, at the top end. Um, a month. A month, mm -hmm. yes. And that is a need-based program. Meaning you have, it's like, I kind of refer to it as public aid for sick people. It's similar to public aid in the sense that you can only have, um, for one person, up to $2,000 of assets. Um, they exclude one car and, and a house that you live in. Um, but if you have any other household income or assets, um, they, that, that can disqualify you from that program. Um, then you would have to look solely to the Social Security Disability, which works a little bit different than Social Security Retirement in the sense that you may be qualified for Social Security Retirement, have plenty of quarters paid in, but not enough quarters for Social Security Disability because they have to be recent quarters for Social Security Disability. So out of the, you have to work five out of the last ten years prior to your disability starting really to be covered. And so that is a quandary for some people. Mm -hmm. it, and that's especially um, the reason why people should not hesitate to file. I see this every day in my practice where people have waited to file. They, did, they didn't file either because they didn't realize the program existed or they don't consider themselves disabled or because they're such motivated people they are just certain that they are going to get better, they're going to overcome this illness or injury, and they're going back to work. So they hesitate to file. Or they have filed, and they got a denial letter, and they just gave up. And, and really, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I, it, you certainly won't find it written anywhere. No one will admit it. But um, myself and other attorneys that do this throughout the country, we're all convinced that there's an unwritten policy to deny these people at the first and second levels because they're, statistically there are a huge percentage of them that will just give up. They'll mm -hmm. get that denial letter and they'll just say, oh well, I guess I just don't qualify. And, mm -hmm. and they've never spoken to an attorney or anybody to tell them, oh don't worry about that. That has nothing to do with whether you have a good claim or not. So um, that's one of the reasons. And then they wait and then all of a sudden now they're not covered anymore. 
Social Security disability is somewhat like an insurance policy. Um, insurance policy, if you, you can pay your premiums in advance, but at some point if you quit paying them, they're going to send you a letter saying you're no longer covered because you quit paying your premiums. Well, if you pay, quit paying in those quarters when you get your paycheck because you're not working anymore, after about five years of not working, now that's if you work steady, um, and then all of a sudden no work, after about five years, you're not covered anymore. And, and, and so that presents, it's not that you couldn't apply then, but, but there's some problems that, that arise that are, you know, more than today's discussion allows. Sure. But um, the, the message is don't hesitate on that one because it really can cause you problems down the line. And you're losing money that belongs to you. It's your money. Sure. And I tell people, you know, on that program, you could be, Donald Trump, you could, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have or, um, I talked to somebody recently about who has cancer about filing and she says, oh, well, I don't want to file, my husband makes plenty of money, mm -hmm. but she may not live, she's 44 years old, she may never live to see, to receive the money she paid in. Mm -hmm. So it's her money. Uh, I see. So why, so why, why hesitate? Not, huh? Why hesitate? Sure. You know, who, whose household could not use um, an, a, another shot in the arm? Um, the average Social Security disability um, amount is $1,100 a month. It depends on your wages and your earnings, it, so the, no two people are the same, but that is the average. It comes with, that one comes with a Medicare card. After, after a two-year waiting period, so they take when you're disabled and then they add, it's really two years and five months waiting period because there's an, another five months tacked on for another reason. Uh, but ultimately, the person will get a Medicare card just as the elderly get. Uh -huh. um, and so even if you have health insurance, there are often um, co-pays or 80-20s or, you know, do things like that that are or uninsured medical, you know, things that somehow right. are not covered. The Medicare still can help with that. There are other advantages, um, other programs that open up for people once they get that finding of disability. So even if your spouse has income or even if you have assets, there's no reason not to apply for that. It is your money. Sure. And the, the medical benefit, the Medicare benefit, it could be very, very important. Well, especially if the treatment is very expensive. Like, I, I've known people that were getting treatment for cancer, leukemia, mm -hmm. and the drugs, um, like one drug was thousands of dollars a month. And so, you know, no one has that kind of money to, to lay out most sure. of the time, especially if they're out of work. Sure. So it, it's a huge benefit. Can we take an example, a specific example? Let's say that there is um, a, a lady who is, say, 45 years old, and she has been working, uh, like, for example, out of Caterpillar, and she's doing cleaning work or whatever, but she injures her leg such that she has, like, nerve damage, mm -hmm. and so she has a limp, and she can't walk stairs, she can't lift, and so she can't do that kind of work anymore, uh, and she has maybe not even a high school education. What should that person do, and she's been struggling with this, say, for a year, what should she do relative to a, a, a Social Security claim? And she's not working at all. Right. Anymore. Well, that person should apply. Should apply? Uh, that person, I will say, will not be an easy case mm -hmm. because she's under 50. Under 50. 50 is kind of a magic number. The rules start relaxing at age 50. Okay. And you told me some important things. She doesn't have a high school education, so that would be considered a limited education. Mm -hmm. 45 is considered a younger individual, mm -hmm. however. And if the only thing's wrong with her is her leg, then it's going to kind of depend on if it makes it a little harder. If she were 50, uh -huh. th this would be a much easier claim. I see. At 45, we're going to have to really get a little more creative. Um, does she meet what they call the listings of impairments? They've taken the body, the Social Security regulations have, and divided it up just like we did in in class when we studied the human body, like the, the senses, the, the muscular skeletal system, the digestive system, and then within those systems they've taken like maybe the 10 most common disorders and they've explained in very specific terms how bad it has to be to meet the listing for that problem. Um, what you're describing with, you know, her is, is that she could possibly meet the listing. I would have to study mm -hmm. the medical records and, and discuss it with her a little further. Okay. Um, what they're going to try to do with this lady is say that she can do sedentary work. Like sit-down work? 
Right. Essentially, Easy you sit work. more than you do stand, mm -hmm. and and even though she doesn't have education, they the, they they use these vocational experts to say, well, that that are, their job is to study jobs mm -hmm. that exist in the national economy um, from the Department of Labor statistics and descriptions of jobs. They will throw out these jobs like um, lens inspector. That's one they like. Um, apparently, uh, there's somewhere where they make eyeglasses and. They have to check them to see if they're scratches or something uh -huh. before they send them out. So the person is sitting maybe at a table and they're just looking at eyeglasses and then passing them on. They're not on an assembly line or anything. So that they don't require education. They could sit more than they stand. If they got stiff they could, or their leg was going to sleep, they could probably stand up and walk mm -hmm. around a little bit. As long as they can do their job and keep up with production standards and pace. What I usually ask a person like this is, like, are there other issues? Like the fact that she never finished high school and the fact that she's working as a cleaner uh, might lend me to ask, you know, in, in a delicate way, you know, certainly not to judge her, it's because it might help her. Were you in special education classes or were you in regular division mm -hmm. classes? Oftentimes, with someone with the education and, and work history that you described, this person will say, oh, I was in special education. Mm -hmm. And then once I do some digging and get their, I would get their school records, I would see whether Social Security sent them to a psychologist for IQ testing yet. If not, I would ask them to. A lot of times, the person actually has an IQ that falls in the mildly mentally retarded range. These people, with nothing else wrong with them, can often work in an unskilled cleaning position in as a dishwasher, as a busboy, as a laborer, a construction laborer, maybe as even um, in lawn mowing, you know, the exterior maintenance of a building. As long as, you know, they can be shown, they don't have to write reports, they can be shown instead of, you know, read a manual right. or anything, how to do the job, they can function. But you add the one more thing, the leg. And now this person can't find a job. There is a special listing of impairment for that person that with an IQ up in the mildly mentally retarded range that has the one more thing wrong with them. Because a lot of these people can do very manual work, mm -hmm. but then a physical problem occurs and that knocks them out of the job force completely. So that often is something that your client is not going to tell you right away because in their mind, that's not what disabled them because they worked after that. But it is an issue, and it's a very helpful issue. So you had mentioned this lady should apply for Social Security. Yes, she so should apply. How, how does she do that? Does she call you? Does she call the Social Security Department? Does she go down there? How, how, what's well, the process? There's, there's a few processes. Now, if someone has access to a computer and Internet service, mm -hmm. which they could do at the library, I suggest they don't do that because of privacy issues. I don't like people filing Social Security claims down at the library. But if they have access to their own computer and internet service or a, a trusted friend, they could go to ssa.gov and, and it's a fairly simple process. Um, you click on disability on the toolbar, then it'll ask you if you want to apply or mm -hmm. you're appealing. It, you know, so and, you know just, it's very, it's very self-explanatory. Again, now someone that was in special education may need some help doing something like that, but... Can they apply at the Social Security they office? They can. Where they is can. the office? It's at 606 West Pershing, which is the corner of MacArthur and Pershing across from Perkins, the one in Decatur. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's our local district office. Um, I would suggest, if possible, they call and make an appointment. I see. Because otherwise they have to take a number and sit in these very uncomfortable chairs mm -hmm. for a very long time. And especially someone with a bad back, um, you know, or pain issues, that, that's not comfortable, or anybody with anxiety issues. There's usually a bunch of people, small children, it's very chaotic, very noisy. Sure. So if you, have an, if you have to take the number and sit in the chairs and wait, you can do that, but, but it, it, it's not... Better what, to call ahead. Better to call ahead and make an appointment. That way you get in pretty quickly. And it's their job to help you fill out that application. Well, should should this lady that we're talking about contact you first and have you help her fill out the application? I don't do initial applications simply because there's certain things that Social Security wants from the person and such as they want things like 
marriage certificates, birth certificates. They, they, they have, and they are supposed to analyze at that point all the programs the person might be eligible for, such as if they come in and apply, say, I want to apply for Social Security disability, they need to ascertain, well, is the person of limited means and assets, so we should also file an SSI claim in addition to the Social Security disability claim. Um, are they a disabled widow? And that's a whole different claim. So there's some things that they need to do sort of at the beginning. So I like the person to at least go down there and, and, and file their claim or file it online. And they don't have to wait till they're denied. They could call me as soon as possible if, after they've applied, if mm -hmm. they want to. Often attorneys don't want to take the case until after the person's been denied. Sometimes I tell them, wait till you're denied, only because if they are going to be approved, I don't want to take money from them, you know, that, that I have to take a fee. Attorneys get paid 25% of the back pay not to exceed $6,000. That's one of the few areas of law I know about where the attorney and the client cannot make a contract of their own design. The Social Security Administration has already told them what it is. So I, I don't want to take money that I really didn't earn. So I, I, I sometimes will say, well, why don't you just wait till you get that okay. denial? Call me, keep my number, call me. If you do get that denial, yes, I want to talk to you. So this lady files her application today. Mm -hmm. How long does it take before she's going to get her de probable denial letter? Well, th they strive for a 90-day mm -hmm. um, turnaround mm -hmm. at the initial level. Sometimes it's more like 120 days. I've seen it take six months. I, I'm not quite sure what, why, but um, it can take three to six months. So she gets the denial letter in today's mail, then she calls up Susan O'Neill? Right, she makes does. Makes an appointment. Yes, they, she will only have 65 days. It says 60 days in the letter to appeal, but then it goes on to say they're going to allow five days from the date of the letter for the mailing and receipt. Okay. So it's really 65 days, but that's a very short window. Okay. So she needs to call an attorney right away. Um, I do suggest that they call an experienced attorney in this area. Just like medicine is now specialized, you wouldn't go to a podiatrist to, to have brain surgery. You, you should not go to your, the guy that did your work comp case for your social security case. Because, you know, even though he may know a lot about your medical condition, he doesn't necessarily know anything about social security. And so I, I would suggest that they go to someone who has um, a great deal of experience. I've had over 20 years experience. There's um, a gentleman in, in Springfield that is, you know, has similar experience, you know, do some research. Sure. And this week, I think you mentioned you had three or four hearings. I had represent. seven. Seven. I had seven hearings and three appeals. Mm -hmm. and, and I was in two different cities um, in doing hearings this week. So I, you know, I was very, very busy and I am very busy. So the, the client comes to see you and you mm -hmm. counsel her and then you decide to take the case and move forward. What's the next step? You well, file the appeal? I, I usually file the appeal online for them mm -hmm. while they're sitting in my office. There's a few other paperwork, like the fee agreement, that they understand about the 25%. Mm -hmm. um, even though the government says that's what the deal is, the client has to say they agree to that and understand it. Um, there's, because it's the government, there's forms. There's a, another form that says they have a lawyer. So some documents, medical releases, they have to sign. But I can do on my computer their appeal mm -hmm. right then and there. And so they don't have to worry about it. That takes a lot of stress off the sure. client. It's very stressful for them to go down there, and they, they, a lot of them do have e trouble reading and writing, and sure. they don't know what to say. And to be honest with you, I've won a lot of cases just by what I say in the few lines that I'm given about the reason for their disagreement with the prior decision. I, you know, you can only write about three or four lines, but because I know what things are important to Social Security, and the client doesn't. Sure. So even, you know, just knowing what to say or how to phrase it gets someone's attention. I remember Mark Twain's uh, word, uh, motto, he said the difference between a you know, powerful word and, a, and the wrong word is the difference between a lightning bug and lightning. Yeah, well, and it's so like that, it's between getting a, a denied again and winning. Right. So. Um, sometimes I can win the case without a problem mm -hmm. just because they read it and they got, and that, that got their attention. So they say, oh, really? Well, I've got to look at this. Okay. 
So places are screened when they first come in. When you file the appeal. Right, especially at the hearings level. Um, if they've been denied twice, then their case goes actually to Peoria, in, at least in, in the central part of the state, that's where it goes. And staff attorneys review those cases when they first come in, and they look at that. And if something gets their attention, yeah. then they're going to look at the rest of the medical records. Sometimes they will approve, approve the case without any further ado. So the lady's chances of succeeding in her claim for Social Security disability is improved by having experienced counsel. Oh, much better, e even in, in just that small mm -hmm. thing is the appeal. So Definitely you don't want to go to an, a hearing without a lawyer. Okay. That's just like in, in uh, circuit court downtown, you wouldn't want to go there without a lawyer. You don't want to go to the Social Security okay. hearing without a lawyer either. So the first step is the appeal, then there's a hearing usually. There's well, a hearing will be scheduled, and when would it be scheduled after you file well, the appeal? There's the initial claim, then there's reconsideration of the initial claim, so give us, first a appeal. give us a timeline. Well, you what's, what's apply. You apply today and mm -hmm. say 90 days from now you're denied, and then you've got 60 days to appeal. You file the appeal, which is called reconsideration. It goes right back to Springfield to the same people that denied you the first time, and so there's an 87 percent denial rate in Illinois at that reconsideration level. Almost 90 percent of the claims are denied. Yes, and 86 percent nationwide. So we're not that much yeah. off the mark. So um, attorneys, I'm a a member of a national organization of attorneys that do what I do and we've had a dialogue with Social Security for years about even eliminating that step because it seems like such a giant waste of time. I try to prepare my clients for a denial at that level mm -hmm. so they aren't discouraged. And, and I had a lady one time tell me that over the weekend she got her denial and she had to go to the a psychiatric unit because she was so depressed. Mm -hmm. And that just broke my heart. So now yes. I spend a lot of time with people explaining the 87% denial rate. I had a lady who was 59 years old with recurrent metastasized inoperable cancer who they denied at the reconsideration level. And I was so outraged that I called up and got the case recalled back there because at that time there was a 9 to 12 month wait for a hearing and I didn't think she had 9 to 12 months. Wow. Plus she was about to lose everything she had. Yeah. And I was successful in getting them to take another look at it and, and fix it. Okay. But that lady, you can't even imagine that, that a woman her age with recurrent metastasized and operable cancer sure. would be denied, but that's what I'm talking about. Life-threatening okay. diseases, people with very serious diseases are being yeah. denied at, at that level. And I don't, that's why I think sometimes they don't even, they must not even read the medical sure. records, because how could you read them and not come up with a, an approval? On that claim. Right. So you got the application, the denial, then the appeal and reconsideration, yeah. and then what happens? Then we appeal it again, and appeal that's where they go to the, hearing to the hearing office in Peoria. In Peoria. Yes. And a lot of times, if the case is what I consider fairly clear cut, I can ask for because I am an experienced attorney and they have, they know me and they know that I'm not going to waste their time, they will set up at my request what they call senior staff attorney conferences where I can present eight to ten cases. Um, I prepare just like I do for a hearing. I've reviewed all the evidence and, and I'm going to be ready to tell them where to look in the evidence. Look at Exhibit 8F. This is the record from St. Mary's Hospital. She was admitted here. You know, I can point to certain things in the records and we can have a dialogue and the attorney might agree with me and say, yes, I'll pay this claim. Mm -hmm. They might agree that the person's disabled, but they don't agree with the onset date. When they first apply, they ask them, when did you become disabled? Mm -hmm. well, sometimes the person really doesn't know what to say. And so the date may not really, If once you look at the medical evidence, it isn't really supported by the medical evidence. So a different date really sure. might be appropriate. So I can call the client and say, well, they're willing to approve you right now. We don't have to wait for the hearing, but they think you became disabled on this other date. Sometimes that makes no difference whatsoever mm -hmm. on how much they're going to get paid either. Yeah. Because they're only going to get paid Social Security disability one year prior to their application date. So if they say they became disabled three years prior to their application date, they weren't going to get paid for those all three years anyway. So it, it makes no difference, but the client doesn't know that until I explain it to them. And then they go, oh, sure. Yeah, most of the time they say, they, they say yes, because number one, they may be about to lose everything, and they can't wait 
It could be a year before they got a hearing. Yeah. Susan, describe what the hearing process is like so that, you know, if, if our viewers say, boy, is it going to be stressful? Or is there a judge there? What, well, there is, is a, a judge courtroom? there. Can you explain it, that? Yeah, well, one thing that's different is different than what they may be experiencing, you know, like it's, down at the circuit court. It's not like that. It's or more on informal. TV. It's, it's more informal, and they call it a non-adversarial proceeding in the sense that there's no one putting on a case from the Social Security Administration. There's not another lawyer putting on a case against them. Nobody's going to cross-examine them. The judge has to play a kind of unusual role. role. They are sort of acting like a lawyer in the sense that they're questioning the, the client, but they are also the fact finder. So, But they're not really supposed to be protecting the Social Security but Administration. you'll hold your client's hand and take it through and make it as comfortable oh, as yeah. you can. Oh, yeah. I explain everything right. before they get there. What's going to happen to them? What type of questions they're going to... Um, be asked. I take a lot of notes during the hearing. So Susan, I, I, I've been given the time to cut <laughs> off. We've run out of time. It's been okay. a fascinating conversation. Thank you for joining us today. You've given our audience so much information on something very important in their lives. Okay. Thank you, Bill, for having me. You're welcome, Susan. Thanks.